thanks for coming to this event, a continuation of our dialogue on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think the folks that need to be here are here, so a very warm welcome to all of you. I'd like to say a special welcome to Cedric King, Tim Wise, and Sandra Clark, who you will all hear from this evening as part of our ongoing conversation. Special welcome to our Lieutenant Governor, who's been traveling the state to talk about banned books. This evening's program is dedicated to the memory of the late Big Joe Burrell and is made possible in part by the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, Champlain Housing Trust, Eves Bradley and Karen Durfee, Howard Center, Ben and Jerry's, Office of the Vermont State Treasurer, Pomelo Real Estate, m and Bank, Key Bank, Attorneys at Paul Frank and Collins, and Vermont Humanities. Special thanks to UVM Extension, and our media sponsor today is Ron Public. <laughs> Introducing our speakers this evening, our State Treasurer, Mike Pichak, Susanna Davis, Executive Director of Racial Equity for the State of Vermont, and Stuart Ledbetter, Senior Reporter from News 5. It is now my pleasure to welcome Mike Pichat to the podium to introduce our first speaker. Well, uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Cedric King, Army veteran, author, and athlete. But first I want to thank Patrick Brown and the Greater Burlington Cultural, Cultural Resource Center for organizing another evening of uh, thought-provoking, engaging, enriching speakers that uh, will surely bring their words and experiences uh, to the community to enrich us all. Cedric, just by reading his biography, but also meeting him backstage. You can tell that he is the best of America. I believe he'll renew your faith in America. He graduated from the Army Ranger School and went on to serve three tours of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq. While overseas, Cedric's platoon came under heavy fire and he stepped on an IED, awaking eight days later in the United States. Cedric had sustained disfigurement on his right hand and both of his legs were amputated. Even after all this, he said that he is very thankful that he got the chance to serve his country. His courage and dedication to our country has earned him the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, among many other awards. Since his injuries, he has run marathons, climbed mountains, become an author and an inspirational speaker. I look forward to hearing Cedric and his unique experience, and I look forward to him making us want to be better within our families, our communities, and be better for our nation. And with that, I'd love to introduce Cedric King. Where are you at? 1960s. 19, 
Okay, 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 yeah. What's your name, young lady? Gwen, all right, are you ready? All right, get ready, here we go. All right, all you gotta do, Gwen, all I need you to do is just give me the, the final part of this lyric. You, I'm gonna stop at some point in the song, and Gwen, I need you to save the day and pick it up. Are you ready, Gwen? I've got something, I'm not gonna sing it. Wait, if you sing it, then I'm gonna be forced to sing it, all right? I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. Go! Okay, now, Gwen, a lot of people are, are counting on you, all right? You want me to sing it? I've got sunshine. Hey, sing it better. When it's cold outside, go! Just be honest. 
Everybody's been in a dark place before. For me, I lost something, well, two things. <laughs> but it felt like I lost a part of me too. Have you ever been in a situation where, where maybe you, you didn't lose two legs, but you lost somebody? Or maybe you lost something? And in that moment, I'm going to describe how I feel, and maybe I'll describe how you feel too. In those moments when you just lost something that was a part of you for your whole life, what ends up happening is you have this initial feeling of, I just lost this. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. And I've lived my whole life like this. How in the world am I supposed to make it to tomorrow if today I'm without this and it's this difficult? Have you ever been there before? It, it felt like the final chapter. And what's the use of me just getting through right now? It's so difficult, it's so painful, not to mention embarrassing. Not to mention embarrassing that, that now I'm, 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 I'm walking differently than everybody else. There's bandages all over my body. Uh, people are telling me that they love me, but the truth is I don't even love me. So how in the world can you love me?
that have superheroes, but we grew up with superheroes. So don't think that this whole uh, Marvel and DC comic started just 10 years ago. No, it started a long time ago. Now, Donald, who is your favorite superhero? Iron Man. How in the world did Tony get all these powers? He made his powers. How did Spider-Man get these web powers? He got bit by a spider. It's pretty easy. But the spider was a radioactive spider. Everybody's been bitten by something, but I bet you ain't got bit by no super radioactive spider. And you don't run around Burlington, Vermont, doing this all day? No! The Incredible Hulk. Something bad happened to him. I'm pretty sure he, was, he wasn't planning on becoming a, a superhero with all these powers. Something happened in the laboratory one night. Flat. I got struck by a bolt of lightning, made him super quick. Superman's whole planet blew up. Bruce Wayne saw his parents murdered right in front of his face. Now, Bruce was rich, so that helps a little bit. <laughs> helps a little bit, but it's still your mother and your father. Yes, Alfred was there. He was. He took him to a nice mansion. But that's beyond the point, people. What I'm saying is, Bad things do happen to good people. And these superpowers, they come with super problems. Maybe that's one way to look at it. But if you flip it around, everybody's had super problems. <coughs> and that would mean, that would mean this. Your super problem that you have, that day that you just know is the worst day ever. It deposited a super power. Super power. Are you using these super problems in life to help you find your super power? For me, this is my day right here. And I did not look at it as a gift in the beginning. I did. I look at it as maybe this is karma. Maybe when I took the BB gun and I shot the puppy, I am getting some sort of, of payback for that. Now, if there's anybody from PETA in here, it was a long time ago, all right? So listen, the statute of limitations, so you can't, it's, it's, I was seven, I was seven. But we go over our life, we go over the history of our life, and we think that, man, I'm somehow deserving of this. You're not in the way that you think you are. Challenges. They select you. No different than the lottery ticket you pick. This was me hitting the lottery. Out of all the people on that patrol that particular day in Afghanistan, I am the one guy that stepped on them. that small piece of real estate, probably no bigger than my hand. And I am the one that lost a pair of legs. <coughs> now, I have one or two ways to look at this. I can look at it as this happened to me, or, or, no different than you, this maybe happened for me. Did you hear what I just said? I have a choice to make. Did this happen to me? Or maybe did this happen for me? And it doesn't matter which one you pick right now, but I will tell you this. The more you are able to align your mind with the latter, the better your life will be. No, there will still be freezing cold days here in Vermont. Matter of fact, Patrick, thank you for bringing me up here in September. <laughs> thank you for that. It's beautiful outside. I can only imagine what it will feel like here on January the 30th. 
tough. But I now look at whatever comes my way, and I can look at it through the lens of it happening for me. Everybody in here, everyone in here knows exactly what to do when the lottery ticket has all the numbers on it. You know how to party on the beautiful days when it's 70 and sunny outside. You know how to react when she, she says yes to your proposal. You know how to act when, when your contract gets selected. Everybody knows how to react on the good days. But what I am asking you to learn how to do with practice is to look at the not so good days. and say, man, maybe I can use this as well. Maybe this incredibly bitter medicine is actually going to help me get even further in life. Help me bless even more people. Help me be even more generous. Help me open my heart in love again. Is it possible? Of course it is. But will you do it? Will you do it? If the parking meter outside right now, if there is a person outside putting a boot on my rental car right now, I have practiced this philosophy so much that now I think that the guy that is putting a boot on my car probably needs a motivation speech and let me help him out. <laughs> Not to get the boot off my car, but maybe he's going through something. I don't know. Tonight is just a reframing of the way we see things. Because tomorrow is Saturday. It'll be great. Maybe your team will win tomorrow. Who knows? Maybe tonight your high school team is probably winning. Who knows? But I do know Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is coming up. And those days are going to have some sort of hurdle for you to clear. And you know it, and the hurdle knows it. And when Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, Wednesday gets here, I want you have the courage to see it differently than maybe you ever have. No matter what the doctor says. No matter what the teacher says. That relationship that's probably on the rocks and you don't think it will make it, maybe you can look at it through a new lens. I hope you can. It really worked. This is not some sort of uh, I'll pump you up so that you can go back and you can run even faster into the wall. This is, take a second and look at the way that you've been seeing things and maybe look at it through a new lens. Man, it was tough in the beginning. Not just, not just from me looking at myself and, and learning to love what I saw, but also it was tough because now I'm still a husband, I'm still a father. I still want to be looked at as attractive a little bit. I still want my daughters to look up at me like I'm their hero like they used to. And without any promptings from the outside, I automatically started feeling unworthy because of what I saw on the outside. How many of us? Take ourselves down a notch or two or three or four. Not because of what we did on the outside, but how we feel and how we look at ourselves on the outside. What we said, what we failed to do. But the people that really love you, the people that really, really love you, they love you for who you are, they love you for who you are. Love is a gift. 
and it is given, and it doesn't have any strings attached. I'm sure, I'm sure tonight, everyone in this room, yes, you ma'am, yes, you sir, yes ma'am, you, each one of us, we have someone in our life that loves us beyond what we do and what we say and what we provide. People love us beyond that. And I pray, I pray tonight, that you will allow, you will allow yourself to be loved. And through that love, you can maybe find your way back to loving yourself. Now, I want to open it up for Q&A for just a second if we have time. I want to make sure that not only I don't need a boot on my car, but I also want to make sure that everyone in here has an opportunity to ask the question that maybe everyone in here is afraid to ask. Have the courage to raise your hand and, and ask the question that everybody is just like, oh, no, maybe that she has that. No, this is so embarrassing. I am sure there is a question or two, and if there is, I'm going to have the courage enough to answer it. If you have the courage enough to ask it. Three, two, one. Yes, sir. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff, what's up? Sir? How are you doing? Doing great, man. Hey, doing great right now. We'll see you in about 10 minutes now. Jeff, I, I want to I wanna be straight up and honest with you. And like I said, I'm going to have the courage enough to tell you the truth. I'm still working through it. It's a constant daily battle of making sure that my orientation is pointed straight toward this is happening for me. Like, like anybody who's throwing a football, the first time you pick it up, you don't throw that spiral and it's like a, like a bullet the first time. It looks like a duck sometimes, but the more you do it, the prettier it is. And the more I wake up in gratitude, the more I wake up in love and thankfulness, the better my life is. Now Patrick is over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to thank everybody in here tonight for coming out. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, Mr. Brown, for having me. By now you don't know who Tim Wise is, then our problems run far deeper than we realized. But I'll share a few uh, details about him and allow him to uh, regale us with his wisdom afterwards. Tim has spent the last 30 years as an anti-racism educator and author. He's been to over 1,500 college campuses around the country has set foot in every single state in this country, in academia, in corporate settings, in all kinds of organizations, providing people insight and wisdom and genuine calls to action on how to combat racism in the United States. He served as a distinguished professor and advisor to places like Smith College, Washburn University, Fisk University. You'll find him frequently on venues like NPR, 
CNN, MSNBC. His lectures and videos, for those of you who, who keep score through streaming and viewership, have garnered over 30 million views online. And I, I want to highlight the fact that Tim has been doing this, like I said, for over 30 years. That's long before it became fashionable for white people to talk about race and racism. That's long before the great white guilt of 2020, when suddenly everyone was talking about it. And in fact, we're honored to have him here tonight because this isn't his first time visiting us in Vermont. He was here in 2019. Some of you may remember when we uh, came together on MLK Weekend in 2021, right after the release of his essay collection, Dispatches from the Race War. By the way, what you don't know about that day is that he got snowed in and was stuck in Vermont. And yet somehow we managed to bring him back again for a third tour, so it's with uh, deep appreciation that I introduce to you Mr. Tim Wise. Um, well, it is, uh, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to be back. I think there is a chance that the reason that Patrick contacted me to bring me back uh, at this time was not so much because he likes hearing me speak or because he thinks I have something valuable to offer, though I assume both of those are true, but because he just wanted to prove to me that indeed you have a season other than January here. <laughs> Um, it is good to be here. I, I thought the leaves would have turned more, though, Vermont. Like, this is a bit disappointing, but, um, but it's still nice. It's nice and cool. It's better than, than Nashville, where I live, where it was 87 uh, yesterday and really humid, so it's nice to, nice to be back. Um, Patrick did tell me that for this evening, all three of us as presenters were um, sort of charged with telling something personal about ourselves. If you have seen me speak before, you know that I can do an hour of uh, analytical framing, I can do an hour of uh, data-driven presentation to prove the reality of systemic racism and that that is something that I've done in some capacity for, as you heard, over 30 years. But given the time frame that we have and the particular charge that Patrick gave us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of dispense with that. I'm going to assume that those assembled don't need me to prove the reality of systemic racism, and it's sort of weird to have to prove it uh, anyway. But I will tell you a few things that I think will, will illustrate the points that I want to make about race in America and why uh, it is so important for those of us called white in particular uh, to confront that thing uh, that has hung over our heads as a country from its inception and really before its inception. Um, many years ago, when I started doing this work, I was uh, a college activist um, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and um, afterward was a community organizer. And at one point, I was meeting with some of the folks who were sort of my mentors, right? They were going to mentor me through the process of community organizing. And one asked me why I cared about this issue of racism. I didn't, after all, have to at least not in the direct and immediate sense. As a white person, my life didn't depend on challenging it. Now, I would argue existentially it did, but that's a deeper theological question we haven't the time to necessarily parse this evening. But my mentor was saying, you do have the luxury, practically, and indeed I did and I do, of more or less ignoring this thing. So why, Tim, do you care so much about undoing racism as a white man in your early 20s uh, from the South, born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, now going to school in New Orleans, Louisiana. Why this? And I did what any good white liberal would do, which is to immediately quote Martin Luther King Jr., because, uh, of course, that's what we do. We've memorized something that Dr. King said. We don't necessarily understand it, but we memorized it, and we love it, and we're going to offer it as proof of our bona fides. And so I said something along the lines of, well, you know, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And my mentor said, yeah, that's good. That's taken. So I'm going to tell you what. Um, I'm going to give you a week. I want you to think about it, and then I want you to get back to me. 
And he said, while you're taking that week, I want you to take inventory of your life so you can really understand the question that I ask you and so you can offer me an answer that is actually personal and not academic and not intellectual and not activist-y, right? <laughs> not the kind of thing you think you're supposed to say, but the thing that's real. So I went back to my apartment and I did what we did in the 90s, which is we took out a pen and paper and we just wrote stuff down because we didn't have a computer to do it on and I, didn't, I couldn't Google anything, I couldn't look it up, right? I, I had to write it down and so I did about 10 pages of stuff going back, reverse chronologically, to think about how I ended up in the place that I did. And it came to me that it had very little to do with any book I had read, it had nothing to do with any documentary film that I had seen, it had nothing to do with any kind of political orientation or philosophical or ideological propaganda that I had come across. It had nothing to do with any didactic training. It had to do with what I had seen with my own eyes. I am a child of the South, and that actually makes a difference. For those of you not from there, let me suggest to you that it is only white folks from the South or with some connection to the South who I trust at all on the issue of race, because those of us who are from the South Unlike white folks from anywhere else, don't take this the wrong way, please don't be offended. We know that this is the background noise of everything that's ever happened where we live. Now the irony is it's also the background noise of everything that's happened where you live. The difference is if you're not from the South, you don't have to know that. I did. Because my side thankfully lost that war and y'all's side wrote the books, but what you need to remember Right? is that all of us come from a place where race was the background noise of everything that was happening. Another thing Dr. King said, but which you won't hear quoted on MLK Day, is that white America was, these are his words, not mine, poisoned to its soul by racism. His words, what he said was that racism was as native to this country as pine trees and sagebrush and buffalo grass. So it wasn't just my region, but being from that region, I could not help but see some things things and be reminded of some things. I went to preschool at a historically black college, early childhood ed program at Tennessee State University, one of only three kids in the room who weren't black. Why that mattered is that when I started elementary school in 1974 in Nashville, a newly integrated public school system, by the way, even though it was 20 years after Brown v. Board, so for those who remember the Supreme Court said in 1954 that schools should be desegregated with all deliberate speed. There was nothing deliberate nor speedy about a 20-year delay. But there I was in 1974, starting first grade in integrated classrooms, and because I'd been at that spot at Tennessee State where I wasn't the norm, where I didn't get to take myself for granted, and where my closest peers were black kids, and I know as a side note, like all white people tell you they have black friends, normally we're lying. Like all I had, y'all, was black friends. And so when those friends started catching hell from teachers in ways that we were not, those of us who were white, even though all of us were acting fools because we're six, and that's what six-year-olds do, they act like fools, but some get treated differently than others. Some, some folks' foolishness gets policed more than others, even starting in kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third. But because those kids were my friends, not abstractions, not just people on the other side of the room who I didn't know, but these were people I'd either gone to preschool with or folks who looked like the folks I'd gone to preschool with, and so I bonded typically with them, I noticed their differential. I could see it. I didn't know what it was. I mean, I was smart, but it's not like I went home the first week of first grade and said to my mother, Mom, you will not believe the institutional white supremacy at Burton School. <laughs> I mean, I was advanced, but I wasn't that advanced. And yet I knew there was something happening. And years later, when I was 11 years old, playing ball on teams that were almost all black kids. I was on a baseball team with like three white guys and the rest of the kids were black and we went out to a semi-rural area outside of Nashville to play a scrimmage game against a team out there. When we got there, the team wouldn't step on the field with us because they didn't want to play a black team, quote unquote. I beg to remind you this is 1980, not 1950. And not only did they not want to play us, which was really their loss because we were terrible and they would have beaten us. They didn't want to play us, but they surrounded the vehicle with baseball bats, threatened to beat us, I suppose, to death, called the black kids the N-word, the white kids and the white coach N-word lovers, and it was on that day 
that I understood something about race in this country. I understood that it wasn't just a system that was pointed like a dagger at the heart of black people, though it was certainly and most importantly and most directly that, but it was also a system of thought and organization that was pointed like a dagger at the heart of my people as well, because what these children were saying and their coaches did not step in to correct them, and their crappy parents had clearly raised them as such, they were saying that you, white child, you, white child, you, white coach, have somehow transgressed against the team. You have committed treason against us. You have a place and you have forgotten what it is. See, racism isn't just a system that tries to keep black and brown folks in their place. It tries to keep white folks in ours, that is to say, counterposition to black and brown people, just like patriarchy and misogyny does the same thing to men. We are not the targets of it, but I promise you it damages men. It kills men. It limits our humanity just as racism and white supremacy does to white folks. So when I sat and I took inventory, right, I realized that that was the reason I care, because I'd seen what I'd seen. Now here's the twist to this plot. Because if I just stopped there, it'd be like, oh, what a heartwarming story. Tim saw this at 11, it's so smart. Well, here's the problem. Sometimes you see certain things, but you miss other things. And sometimes, when you're a nice white liberal raised by nice white liberal parents, and you assume that you're a good person because you see these things and you care about them and you worry about your black friends being treated differently, being disciplined more harshly, being trapped into lower track classes, being threatened with death by baseball bat wielding bigots in Jolton, Tennessee, because you assume that you're on the right side, the side of the angels, you are therefore good and you are insulated from the charge that you might collaborate with oppression yourself. But here's the problem. The same year that that happened, the same year that I had that bonding experience around overt racism aimed at my friends and teammates, I was in a school where all of the kids that I played ball with were in remedial or standard level classes, and all of the honors or advanced level classes were, with only one or two exceptions, entirely white children. And it wasn't because we were smarter, it wasn't because we had tested better, not that such a test would have been valid in any event, it was because the presumption of our teachers was that those black children were less capable and the white children were more capable, and here's the point, even as I would do anything to protect those friends of mine from those baseball bat-wielding bigots in Jolton, I didn't even notice the systemic and structural injustice to which those same friends and other black kids at that school were being subjected every day. Cedric told you a second ago in his presentation that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Absolutely true. I will go one step further and tell you that sometimes good people get stuck in bad things. Good people get stuck in bad systems. Racism is not about good people over here and bad people over here. It's about good folks caught up in a system that for hundreds of years has been predicated on the perpetuation of inequality. And I know we're not supposed to say that, and there are states where I can't now. This is not one of them. Not yet. A few months ago, I did sneak into Florida. And I brought critical race theory with me in my briefcase. And I felt as though I had brought fentanyl. Right? I was looking around, wondering when they were going to kick me out. But the law hadn't quite changed yet. Now it has. They don't want me back. But we're not supposed to say these things, not because they're not true, but because apparently it'll make white children feel bad if you tell them the truth about the history of America. I would suggest to you that if learning the history of America makes you feel bad as a white person, it's because you're learning about the wrong white people. Let me say it again. If learning the history of this country makes you feel bad as a white person, it is because you were learning about the wrong white people. They are teaching you about the white folks who did the enslaving, who did the land stealing, who did the conquest, who did the imperialism, rather than those who have been here all along, stretching back to the colonies, not enough of them, but more than you were taught, who stood up against all of that because there were always white folks who said hell no to that. There were always white folks who stood in solidarity with black folks and with brown folks, with indigenous peoples, always. And the fact that you can't name them 
in most cases, is not your fault. It's the fault of an educational system that didn't teach you about them. Right? There's plenty of things that we can be proud of as residents of this country, be we citizens or not, but among those things surely must be the examples of cross-racial solidarity. And if we're going to really perpetuate that kind of solidarity, we've got to do more than just notice the obvious, like I did in Jolton, the obvious bigot. Like the fifth grade teacher that I had the year before that happened, who my mom got fired from her job for criticizing my friendship with those kids. She actually made the mistake of telling my mother that any white parent who would let their white child go to public school in this day and age obviously needed to have their head checked. Well, my mom didn't take that well. She got that teacher removed from her source of employment. Good for her. But neither she nor I acknowledged the institutional racism that was happening in that school. So we got rid of Ms. Brownover, and then we came back to school the next week in those same academically segregated classes, supposedly on the basis of merit, but not really, on the basis of assumptions about merit. Good people, well-intended, getting caught up in bad systems. And when you're a good person in a bad and flawed system, it's an open question as to whether you'll change the system or it'll change you. So keep that in mind. We can never allow ourselves to get too haughty about how progressive we are, how liberal we are, how supposedly anti-racist we are, how concerned about oppression we are, because we're all just part of the same stew, right? One last story. Because it is usually around this time that someone thinks to themselves, God, you know, you're right about that. I mean, I sort of get that, like I can see that, but, you know, it's really not my fault. I mean, I didn't create the system this way. I'm not to blame for it. Somebody always wants to tell you, you know, they didn't own any enslaved person. I'm fully aware of the age of the people in my audiences. I know that none of you owned another human being. Thank you for clearing that up for me now. Uh, I know that very few of you probably are old enough to have owned a business during segregation or to have lynched someone in the 1930s. I'm clear on that. Right? But we as white folks love to say that. We like to say, well, I wasn't there. I didn't do what I feel bad. I mean, we really should do something about that. But it isn't my responsibility. Here's the final story to make clear to you that it is. And it's not a story about race at all. It's a story I've told, but I haven't told it in a couple of years, so if you've heard it before, uh, it might be a little rusty, but uh, here it is. So this is a story about what happened when I graduated from college and moved into a big house with nine other people. As a side note, if you don't learn anything else tonight from my presentation, that would be a shame, but if you do not learn anything else this evening from my presentation for the love of God take this away never should you deliberately move into a house with nine other people <laughs> this is going to be a horrible horrible mistake even if you even if you shine it up with the idea that it's a progressive press collective or some shit which is what we did right we're running an underground paper no we're not we're just living in filth and squalor. Nine of us, ten of us, that's all we're doing. We're splitting rent, that's why we did it. I mean, rent was $525 a month. I don't mean per person, I mean total. It was 1990, so. $52.50 a month per person, man. When you are broke and just out of college, you will jump at that because you don't know what's coming. Even when you add the cable bill and the light bill and we split the food, the grocery, you still look at it like 100 a month, man. You, can't beat it, right? Don't do it. Don't do it. I did it. And about, I don't know, maybe two months into this little experiment of communal living, uh, I learned why it was a bad idea. Right? Um, so I've been at work during the day, and I worked in the offices of the campaign that was formed for the purpose of defeating David Duke, former Klan leader, lifelong white supremacist, neo-Nazi, when he ran for the U.S. Senate. This was that year. And I came home from a long day of work fighting Nazis, or at least this one Nazi, right? I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I walk in, and uh, one of the roommates of the nine, whose turn it was to cook dinner, because we didn't just split the cost, we also took turns cooking, it was his turn. He had made a big pot of gumbo for the night, because it's New Orleans and that's what you get. And man, it smelled good, and it smelled, it even had shrimp in there, not many, like I said, we were broke, but there were like three. Three shrimp for ten people. 
And they weren't even like big shrimp. They weren't like jumbo shrimp. They were like popcorn shrimp, maybe even smaller than that, but it was enough to make us think that we had seafood gumbo, so we felt like some kind of way about that, like really excited and rich for the minute, you know? So it smelled great, and when my roommate asked me if I wanted some, I was like, man, it is tempting, but I didn't know you were making this tonight. So as a result, I ate already before I came back uptown, but I tell you what, take some, uh, put it in the fridge, uh, in a container, I'll, I'll take some to work tomorrow. He said, cool, I'll do that. I said, fine, I went upstairs, went to my room, watched TV, whatever, listened to music, whatever we did for fun in 1990. There wasn't much. There wasn't a lot to do, right? I mean, so, I mean, really, like social networking was you just like walked down the hall and you were like, hey, what you doing? And then your roommate was like, nothing, fool, it's 1990, go back to sleep. Get back with this in like 20 years, we'll have some shit to do, but not yet. Um, so I just went to bed sort of early, woke up the next morning like 6.30, came downstairs to get my coffee to go back to fight Nazis for another day. Uh, and I noticed that the pot of gumbo was still sitting on the left front burner of the stove where it had been the night before. No portion of it had been saved for me, by the way. And more importantly, no portion of the pot had been cleaned by the person who made the mess. This was an incredible problem. It looked disgusting. I was a little bit frustrated with the fact that there was none for me to take to work, but also with the fact that the mess had been left for one of us, perhaps me, to clean. So I thought to myself, well, what the hell? I've got like 15 minutes. I'll just clean it before I head down to the streetcar. So I grabbed the pot. I brought it over to the sink. I grabbed some sponges or whatever, I grabbed some soap and I started to run water in the pot of gumbo and then I stopped myself, like halfway and I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to do this. I didn't make this gumbo. Hell, I didn't even eat any of this gumbo. Now I felt incredibly self-righteous because I was talking myself out of doing the hard work, which is a skill you learn in college. So, <laughs> so I... So I put the pot of gumbo right back where the hell I found it, on the left front burner of the stove, walked off to work, came back that night, 6.30, walked in, and another one of my roommates is making dinner for the evening on the right front burner of the stove. But on the left front burner, where it has now been for an entire 24 hours, is that same stale, crusted, disgusting pot of gumbo. It has not, to this minute, been cleaned. I look at my roommate, like he has lost his mind and said, how in the hell can you make dinner for us tonight on the right front burner when I'm fairly confident you can smell the dinner from last night on the left front burner because it is right there under your nose. He said, hey man, I didn't make the gumbo. I wasn't even here for dinner last night. I'm like, me either. And I said, so you don't need to clean it, do you? He said, hell no, do you need to clean it? I said, hell no. He said, do you want some lentils and rice? I said, hell yes. Give me some lentils and rice. And so I self-righteously ate the meal for that evening, went upstairs, did whatever we did for fun in 1990, once again went to bed early. Six in the morning came. And I had forgotten to set an alarm. But uh, here's a tip. If you are living in a house with nine other people where a pot of gumbo has been sitting on the stove for what is now 36 and a half approximately hours, trust me when I tell you, you are not going to need an alarm clock to wake your ass up because the smell is going to crawl out of the pot of gumbo on the legs that it grew literally overnight. And it is going to crawl across the kitchen, across the living room floor, up the back steps, down the back hall, go under your door frame or through the keyhole and find with the precision of a laser that thing on the front of your face that you call a nose and you will be awake. And now I was. And I was pissed because I knew what the smell meant. I knew what was waiting for me on the left front burner of the stove having not been cleaned by anybody, least of all the guy that made the mess. So I stomp out of my room, loud, trying to wake folks up. Can't find anybody. I live with nine other people, none of them around to bother. The guy that made the gumbo's like, where's Waldo? Nobody knows where the hell he disappeared to. Just disappeared into the ether, just made the gumbo, made the mess, skipped town and left it for us. And I get down to the living room, I look into the kitchen, I see the pot of gumbo on the left front burner of the stove, and I'm confident to this day that the gumbo saw me. <laughs> because it had evolved, you understand? Evolution works quick with gumbo. And it was at that moment that I came to understand maybe the most important lesson I had ever learned about anything. Not household cleanliness, but anything. What was the lesson? The lesson was it didn't matter any longer whether I had made the mess. 
It didn't matter any longer whether I was, as the saying goes, the author of all this unpleasantness. The only thing that mattered was that I was tired of living in that funk. I was tired of living with the residue of somebody else's actions for which I was not to blame, but for which I now had to take responsibility because if I didn't, I wasn't confident that it was ever going to get cleaned up. The same is true with human society. When we get tired of living in the funk and the residue of other people's decisions, we will clean up the mess, not because we created it, but because we are the only ones left. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate you very much. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Stuart Ledbetter and I'm thrilled to be here to introduce our final speaker of the night. Uh, she's a journalist of some renown, a veteran newsroom leader uh, in industry I know a little bit about, um, and she's a longtime advocate for diversity and inclusion uh, to try to bridge the uh, trust gap between journalists, and communities of color. I don't know what you do on Friday mornings, but uh, every Friday morning, uh, if possible, about 8, 20 or 25 or so, on Vermont Public, uh, I listen for StoryCorps. And it is the best five minutes of radio uh, of, of your week, or just about. Uh, drawing human connections between mothers and daughters, and students and teachers, and people at different stations in life. Sandra Clark is the CEO of StoryCorps in New York. Uh, it's a national treasure. Uh, she's been there for um, going on two years or so, but was formerly a managing editor, which um, I means she's a big uh, big decision maker at the Philadelphia Inquirer and later in Philadelphia at WHYY, which is the NPR and um, PBS station in Philadelphia. It's my great pleasure. Please give a big Burlington welcome to Sandra Clark. shoes on so the mic is, should be about my at my uh, my height here well it's such a pleasure to be here um, you know my first time in Vermont uh, and uh, greetings from my uh, our chief of staff at StoryCorps who uh, actually met his husband here in Burlington Vermont uh, at a gay pride parade in 1987 so he has particularly fond memories of Vermont uh, thank you so much uh, Stuart and um, Patrick, you know, I had a little bit of time to spend with Patrick Brown yesterday, and gosh, you all are so lucky to have him here. What an icon, uh, just a special, special person, and so I wanted to make sure I acknowledged um, that. I, I feel like I'm on the right stage with the right people. Uh, Seth, Cedric, my dad, my dad was a career army uh, soldier, uh, and so there was so much that resonated with me about, you know, the inspiration that uh, Cedric shared with us. And um, Tim, well, uh, my kid started the new year burning, uh, actually letting spoil a whole pot of gumbo. My dad's from Louisiana, uh, and so that did not go over well in our house. Gumbo, for those of you who don't know if you make it right, it's like a $200 pot of, pot of stew. So anyway, uh, a pleasure to be here. Let me get this started. Uh, okay, I got so much instruction before. I wanted to start with a picture of my, my, my family, my parents, and that is me, by the way. Uh, all those years ago, that's my daughter, who's now 27. Um, that's the first time my parents met my daughter. I came back from the Peace Corps uh, and working in Africa with a husband and a kid. Um, and you know, when I think about, the reason I want to share my parents is because they are no matter where I am, no matter what I do, or my guiding light for everything that I do. Um, my mother uh, was, from, is, was from Japan. Um, we were, my dad was stationed in the middle of Kansas, Fort Riley. 
Uh, my mom created Little Japan in the middle of Kansas. She ordered in her sushi, she ordered her, you know, all, her, all the ingredients for every dish you can imagine. Uh, she watched Japanese television by satellite um, in the middle of Kansas, and, and she was never called Kinko. Her name is Kinko, and Americans always called her Kate because Kinko was too hard to pronounce, I guess until Kinko, you know, the print shops opened up, right? Uh, but it does show you about, you know, the, the Americanization of someone's culture and how that works. My dad was a career soldier, you know, grew up in poverty in, in uh, Louisiana, Morgan City, Louisiana. Uh, the military was his ticket out. And uh, not just, you know, opening up the world for himself, but for all of us, uh, for, for me and my sisters. Um, my dad, you know, raised the flag in front of our house every single day. Um, he, you know, endured incredible racism in his life, even wearing his uniform. Uh, but the thing about him that was so interesting was that he was just this humane giant. Uh, he was this person who, um, you know, I don't think as military kids we appreciated what it meant to be in the military. It's amazing how you don't even know what that means uh, when you're living with it. These days you barely see it, right? Because the representation of military life is all about those Facebook reunions that you see and that you can just watch over and over again of people surprising their families. But there's nothing about military life at all. Um, and my dad, after he retired, he became a mall walker. Uh, in the middle of Salina, Kansas, and it wasn't the most diverse place in the world. And what we found out um, after he died was that he saved so many marriages. And most of the marriages he saved were actually white families, right? Because he's walking through the mall in the middle of Salina, Kansas. He was a great listener. Uh, people would come out and confide in him, and he would drive my mother crazy. He'd be gone for hours, and she's like, where the hell is he? Well, he was at the mall. And he was counseling one person after another who used to wait for him to walk across the mall so they can talk about their issues and their families. And many people came up to us afterward and told us uh, that he actually saved their families, saved their marriages, saved their children. Um, and so that was an in incredible legacy for somebody who himself uh, endured so much. And as a military kid, we also had no sense of why he would wear his purple hard hat all the time. It used to drive us crazy. Every year, we would say like, Dad, don't you want a Nike hat? You know, how about Adidas, right? We had no clue what a purple heart meant until after he really, after he died, and then me and my sisters divided up his purple hearts. So he had earned not just one, but three. Um, so, you know, this is who I honor when, I, uh, when I'm here. This is who I honor. Uh, now that I'm at StoryCorps. You know, my journey to StoryCorps um, is very much, you know, kind of like uh, Peter Palmer wrote in his book, Let Your Life speak, be, speak to You. He writes, before you tell your life what you intend to do with it, listen to what it intends to do with you. And so listening is what took me to StoryCorps. Uh, how many people know StoryCorps here? How many people don't know StoryCorps here? And it's fine if you raise your hand, because you're the reason that I'm at StoryCorps, because everybody needs to know StoryCorps. So StoryCorps, and this is, you know, StoryCorps, those of you who know StoryCorps, and you hear these stories, and they do, you know, they make us swell with emotion, they make us pull over the side of the road. Um, you know, StoryCorps is always talking about connecting people, helping us, cre creating empathy and understanding. But, you know, as with fresh eyes on StoryCorps, because I, I, I think StoryCorps does so much more. These stories from everyday people do so much more for us. And so we, we're now leaning in hard on a new North Star, which is the StoryCorps actually helps us believe in each other by illuminating the humanity and possibility in all of us, one story at a time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here, 20 years ago, Dave Isay started StoryCorps, and he knew something that maybe all of us didn't quite know. He knew that, you know, people needed to find ways to connect to each other, to, to hear experiences uh, from each other. And so he set up this booth in Grand Central Terminal uh, in New York City. And, and, you know, I mean, anybody who's been there knows that that's where people just like tens of thousands of people a day, right? He set up this booth, two microphones, the lights are low. Uh, in this in this this sound booth, um, 
And, and you have two seats, and people sit across from each other, and you come into the StoryCorps booth, and you bring someone whose story you really want to honor. Uh, you know, there's something that he knew that happens when you're, when you're just talking to each other, sitting across from each other, you share things with each other that you wouldn't in any other way, right? And we know that we are now in an age of documentation where we're taking pictures all the time and getting videos of each other all the time. But how often do we actually sit in quietude and you ask each other questions like, what are you most proud of? Uh, what would you do differently? Right, all those kind of questions that we even as family members don't even ask each other, but we've got a million pictures in our phones. So today, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Uh, by the way, here, here are some of the StoryCorps stories. Now, again, StoryCorps is everyday people. They're not trying to get rich. They're not trying to be on reality TV, right? They come into the StoryCorps booth uh, and tell us what's most important to them and what legacy they want to leave behind. And most of them, uh, most of them send their stories to the Library of Congress, which is what, where our, all these stories are archived, if people choose to have them archived there. So a hundred years from now, your friends or someone in your family can find that story. And you can see there's just an incredible mix of story. We started the sound booth, uh, then we create, had an Airstream trailer that crosses the country capturing stories. We work in partnership with our public media partners, and shout out to uh, Vermont uh, Public, which hosted me today. It was so, so wonderful to be at the station. But this is what StoryCorps does in partnership. There's our Airstream trailer. Here's where we've been just this year. We've been in every single state across the country in rural communities and uh, big cities, as you can see. Um, and so I'm going to share uh, a couple of stories because, you know, we talk a lot about um, diversity. We talk about how we connect to each other. We talk about what's in the underbelly, uh, uh, you know, that's creating so many problems for us all. But I wanted to also share some examples of what happens when we actually lean into each other and when we have some hope in humanity. I wasn't planning on having you as my roommate. I actually thought that if Bowdoin College knew I had to, they wouldn't let me come to college. So I hadn't mentioned it to anyone. And I uh, got a job working at Staples cleaning at night. And I had to take you in with me at work sometimes and hide you in the closet. <laughs> I think I lost something like 27 pounds just from stress. and not eating because I didn't have enough for both of us. My basketball teammates were my first babysitters. I just remember coming from class and there were four giant guys and then there was this 18 month old who was tearing up the room. <laughs> were you ever embarrassed bringing me to class or uh, just having me in general? I felt a little awkward, but never embarrassed. There were times when the only way I could get through was to come in and look at you, see you sleeping, and then go back to my studies. And my graduation day from Bowdoin is a day I'll never forget. You know, all of my classmates, they stood up and gave me their only standing ovation. I remember walking up with you and having my head in your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, the uh, dean called both of our names as he presented us with the diploma. So, technically, I already graduated from college. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> the degree only has my name on it, so you still gotta go. I really admire your strength. And I love you. <laughs> I draw my strength from you. I always have, and I still do. Sometimes when we're watching these animations, we forget there are real people who came in and they wanted to document their stories. Uh, knowing that he was dying, Will wanted to do this um, conversation with his daughter. 
And what StoryCorps does is it reminds us how we live and also that what we want to leave behind. Uh, and so, you know, we're so grateful that Will uh, was able to share that story with us. Um, you know, so much of our issues in this country come from the you know, fact that we don't get to see real representations of each other, right? I mean, we hear so many stories about black fatherhood, never have seen that one. These are stories that defy uh, stereotype. And getting back to my parents, you know, I never saw a single representation of my family in media as I was growing up. Uh, never saw any representation of my family uh, on TV and magazines and textbooks. And so, you know, invisibility and false narratives walk hand in hand, and, and that is very much one of the things that um, I think ails us. Um, another story, um, and this one is, is one I love, uh, you know, really, again, an example of how we assume uh, and how we can see light. riding to school with my oldest brother, and on the way to school, I'm putting glitter all over my face. And my brother said, what in the hell are you doing? I said, I'm putting on my costume. He said, well, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that. So he dropped me off at the school, and he called my dad up, and he said, Dad, I think you better get up there. This is not going to look good. So my dad drove up to the high school. And he had his farmer jeans on, and he had cow crap on him, and he had his clodhopper boots on. And when I saw him coming, I ducked around the hall and hid from him. And it wasn't because of what I was wearing. <laughs> it was because of what he was wearing. So the assembly goes well, and I'm climbing the car, and I'm riding home with my father. And my father says to me, uh, I was walking down the hall this morning and I saw a kid that looked a lot like you ducking around the hall to avoid his dad, but I know it wasn't you because you would never do that to your dad. And I squirmed in my seat and I finally busted out and I said, well, Dad, did you have to wear your cow crap jeans to my assembly? And he said, look, everybody knows I'm a dairy farmer. This is who I am. And he looked me square in the eye. And then he said, now how about you when you're a full grown man? Who are you going to go out with at night? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I think you do know. And it's not going to be that McLaughlin girl that's been making goo goo eyes at you, but you won't even pick up the damn telephone. And I'm going to tell you something today, and you might not know what to think of it now, but you're going to remember when you're an adult, don't sneak. Because if you sneak like you did today, it means you think you're doing the wrong thing. And if you run around and spend in your whole life thinking that you're doing the wrong thing, then you'll ruin your immortal soul. And out of all the things a father in 1959 could have told his gay son, my father tells me to be proud of myself and not sneak. My reaction at the time was to get out in the hayfield and pretend like I was as much of a man as I could be. And I remember flipping 50-pound bales three feet up into the air going, I'm not a queer, what's he talking about? But he knew where I was headed. And he, he knew that making me feel bad about it in any way was the wrong thing to do. I had the patron saint of dads for sissies. And no, I didn't know it at the time but I know it now. So, uh, Patrick Haggerty uh, died this year, I believe, uh, and this is just a, you know, gem of a story, right? And it's, it's, it's just turning so many of the narratives that we see on its head. I mean, his dad understood something. Uh, that he himself could not uh, even accept in himself for quite a long time. Uh, and living in our truth sometimes is really, really difficult. Um, the next story I want to share is going to be a little bit of a tough one, uh, because not everything is happy and glowing. Uh, when people come into the StoryCorps booth, you know, they, they are sharing stories with us about the history of our country, too. They're sharing stories about moments in time. 
And what I always say about story for stories is that the generosity of folks who come in and tell their stories, they're also willing us to be better. And they're, they're sharing us examples of, of things that we ought to be thinking about. You know, we know that one of the things that really ails us in this country is, is gun violence, uh, mass shootings, uh, in, in almost anywhere you go. Um, and there's something really basic about uh, this next piece. Um, uh, this mother and son came in to talk about something that I think most people are familiar with now, which are active shooter drills. <laughs> What emergency drills did you have as you were growing up in school? Fire drills and tornado drills, and that was it. So can you tell me exactly what happens in active shooter drills? The teacher is supposed to lock the door, turn the lights off, and push this big desk behind the door. And the first time I did an active shooter drill, I saw her having a hard time with this, so I decided to come help her. Because if she doesn't get the desk on the door in time, the intruder can open it. So what do you do next after you push the table? The class is supposed to stand on the back wall, but I decided to stand in front of the class because I want to take the bullet and save my friends. So did your teacher ask you to stand in front of the class? No. My life matters, but it's kind of like there is one person that can come home to the family, or there can be 22 people that come home to the family. Do you know why it's hard for me to accept that? Because I'm such a young age, I shouldn't really be giving my life up. Like, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Right. If there's any a time that I want you to be selfish, it's then. I need you to come home. So, would you still stand in front of your friends, even with me telling you not to? <laughs> yes. I get that you would want me to come home, but it's really not a choice that you can make. It's a choice to have to make. I see now that there's nothing I can say that would change your mind. I just hope that it never comes to that. Talking about this makes me feel sad, but you raised a good person. And this is why I can't have the conversation with you. You keep saying things like that. I'm speechless. You're 10, and you're that 10-year-old who doesn't clean their room, and... <laughs> There is no handbook for this. This is why the conversation always ends between you and I in dead silence. Because I'm a mother. And I don't know what to say. Whew. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to share that, and I don't care if I'm a CEO, I don't care what title I have. I mean, first and foremost, I'm a mom. And, um, you know, when I think about uh, having been, been a journalist, you never leave journalism, so I still am. But, um, you know, I think about, you know, how templated our coverage has become after each and every one of these tragedies, if we really think about it, right? It's, it's the same thing. You know, uh, something happens, media goes in, you find your heroes and your villains, uh, you, you, you know, do vignettes of the victims, you try to find as many pictures as you can, uh, uh, you, you figure out what the truth is or not, and then in a case like Uvalde, that truth didn't emerge on day one or day two or day three. Uh, and, then, and then the media leaves, and the families are left to pick up these pieces. And when I think about how, you know, we as a country, uh, I mean, you know, we can't just come together for kids, right? Uh, there's, no, there's no party labels on any of this kind of stuff. And the reason I, I played that today is because one of the things that StoryCorps is doing is a project called One Small Step. Uh, you know, we can either decide we're gonna be bystanders and we're gonna just, you know, walk past all these issues that are keeping us divided, or we can decide that we're gonna lean into each other and help us believe in each other. And so one of our projects now uh, that we've had for a couple of years is called One Small Step. 
and it's not bringing people together to talk about politics and to battle, because that's usually the thing that often happens, right? As soon as the you know, media gets there and a couple of politicians will say a few words, and then it all just goes away as though nothing happened, right? We don't talk about something as basic as this, where we all signed up for uh, our kids having to have this, our administrators, our teachers, um, every single day. Right? And somebody told me recently that his four-year-old, uh, their school had a drill and they, they rebranded it and they called it the kitchen because active shooter drill was too scary. So three and four-year-olds now hear about the kitchen. Right? Um, I wanted to play just a little bit of a, CB, uh, uh, of a 60 Minutes piece uh, on One Small Step uh, because this is, this is, um, this is our, our, this is StoryCorps um, is working with our public media partners, with libraries, with cities, um, to see if we can really attack this issue of toxic polarization that is, that is just breaking us all apart. Um, and, and giving people a pathway, right, to see each other as human beings and not to start off talking as politics and battling. So here's just a little snippet from 60 Minutes. I think what makes one small step special is that all of us believe in every cell of our body that there is a flame of good in you, whether you're liberal or whether you're conservative. And our job is to fan that flame until it becomes a roaring fire. So I take my hat off to Dave. I think, I think once more he's proving that like, he, he's willing to walk the walk. And when you heard about the One Small Step initiative, what did you think? It is very, very difficult for us to hate one another. When I'm looking you in the face and we talking about what we like to cook our children for dinner, and we talking about how difficult it is to get our babies into college. It isn't an easy fix. It isn't some kind of hocus pocus where, you know, kumbaya, it's all fine. It isn't any of that. He knows that. Um, but somebody got to do something. So that was uh, Jason Reynolds who was talking. He was now, you know, he was started off as a historical facilitator and is now a New York Times best-selling adult, young adult author. And he stays connected to us uh, because he knows that the stories that he heard as a facilitator are the things that inform us and help us, um, help us evolve. Um, here's an example. I, I want to show examples of, of what it looks like when you see each other as human beings and what's that one piece of commonality that you have no matter what your political uh, uh, you know, whatever side you're on, right? There is a piece of commonality. Are you a veteran? Are you a grandparent? Uh, did you, are you a widower? Um, and here's, here are two people who came together in a really unlikely way, and this was uh, during a protest at the University of Texas in, in 2016. I noticed you with the hat, mm -hmm. and I noticed that you were surrounded by some people and I noticed that they were being kind of threatening, and then somebody snatched your hat off your head. And that's the point where I, something kind of snapped inside me because I wear a, um, a Muslim hijab, and I've been in situations where people have tried to snatch it off my head. And I rushed towards you, and I just started screaming, leave them alone, give me that back. I don't think we could be any further apart as people and yet it was just kind of like this common, that's not okay moment. You are genuinely the only Muslim person I know. I just, it's not that I've actively avoided, it's just, yeah. I've just never been in the position where I can uh, interact mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. So I guess my views on uh, the Muslim community have been influenced by a lot of the news articles and, and things of that nature. I feel like a lot of times in the media, you don't see the normal Muslim, the one that listens to classic rock like I do. <laughs> you, don't, you don't meet that Muslim. Can you tell me about where you grew up? What was that part of your life like? So I was born in Baghdad, in Iraq. I moved to the US when I was 10 years old. Okay. Being uh, a Muslim girl, I stood out in almost every single way that you can in middle school, the worst time to stand out. What about you? How was it like when you grew up? I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a vastly different experience socially. It was I didn't have I guess as many friends as most people would. I only went to public school one year of my life, and I got in three fights and I lost all of them. <laughs> I actually lost a lot of friends because of the selection because of my political stance. So I hope that I can 
be the reason that someone decides to talk to someone as opposed to just cutting them out of their life or blocking them on Twitter, you know? I'd like for this to encourage other people to engage in more conversations yeah. with people that you don't agree with. What's all about? I'm so glad I wasn't the only one who felt like that. Huh. So, you know, we're about to be overtaken, right, by uh, all the national politics, all the craziness that's coming with it's already started. Um, but I think, you know, we can choose to engage in it, or we can choose you can, we can choose to be bystanders or we can choose to lean into each other. Uh, and sometimes, I gotta say, sometimes the hardest ones are people in our own tribe, right? Who don't want you talking to someone else, who don't want you to, you know, don't want you to be seen. Uh, you know, we just launched One Small Step in Columbus, uh, Georgia. And um, two of the people who ended up doing a story core conversation with each other was the head of the NAACP and uh, some, uh, and, and uh, the former head of the Republican, local Republican party there. They had circled each other for years and years, never had a conversation with each other. Um, and you know, we need some leadership, uh, some real commitment to model this for everybody because you know, otherwise we're all just gonna be just you know, in, in, in the vortex, right? Uh, you can find out more about One Small Step on uh, storycore.org uh, if you would like to participate. And finally, I'm going to leave us with, okay, uh, you know, uh, some, some hope, right? Uh, I think you've seen perseverance and hope through so many of these stories. And again, sometimes we forget these are stories from everyday people, and this is their truth. Um, this is a another father and son uh, conversation. Um, but if you listen to it, what you're going to find is that it is, it is really built on a father trying to raise a black son in a country where he knows there's an unjust criminal, criminal justice system, um, and yet he wants his son to walk out without blocking his, his own uh, possibilities. So I'm gonna close with um, a piece on Aiden and uh, Albert Sykes. I... Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out, the first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle and he was like, here's your baby. That was the most proud moment of my life. Don't tell your brothers, cause it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want that paint to look like at the end, but also knowing you can't control the paint strokes. You know, the fear was just, I gotta bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I thank you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together. But also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? Yes, I understand that. Yeah, so that's how you gotta think. You decide that you wanna be a cab driver, then you gotta be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember by my dad. Uh, he says it like I'm on the way out of here, or like I'm on the way to go. So Dad, what are your dreams for me? My dream is for you to live out your dreams. It's an old proverb that talks about when children are born, children come out with their fists closed because that's where they keep all their gifts. And as you grow, your hands learn to unfold because you're learning to release your gifts to the world. And so for the rest of your life, I want to see you live with your hands unfolded.
Thank you all so much. Um, that's my wish for you too. And I'm uh, from Vermont Public Media Sponsor Night, proud home of StoryCorps. What an amazing evening. Let's give thanks to our speakers, Cedric King, Tim Wise, and Cedric Park. Thanks to the Bear, Burlington Multicultural Research Center for putting this on, and Patrick Brown. Take care. Good evening.